Throughout this series, this generosity series, we've been showing you videos and stories of folks in our church who um, are involved in one way or the other. And so I, I want to just give a shout out for making those videos happen. Um, Katie Crumbly and Morgan Brooks, who um, has um, worked behind the scenes to make sure those videos took place. So we've got a couple more videos that will be going out on social media and um, in the community and through emails this, this upcoming week. But, um, but they're the ones who made that happen. And so we're truly are grateful for them. Morgan is a student up at um, North Georgia and I'm a film um, student up there. And so we um, appreciate her and her willingness to come out and be a part and helping, out, helping us out with those videos. So I'm truly grateful for them. And um, as we go, as we begin our time this morning, I just, I want to step back and I just want to, I just want to pray and uh, just take a moment to pray. You know, we, um, if you grew up in Gainesville, I, I grew up here, but then I moved away and now I'm coming back and, and um, you know, you, you're familiar with certain establishments here in town and um, the Mucky Barrel was one of them. And, um, and so I just want to, I want to lift up Chris Jones' family in our prayers and um, is, is who passed away this past week and just want to lift all of them up. And also, um, if, if you saw in the news this past week, you saw also um, just the, what was going on in Pittsburgh. And um, we just want to, we, we need to pray. So can we do that real quick? God, our world yearns, longs, cries out. For peace. And Lord, I'll be the first to admit that sometimes my calling out, I'm wondering why I don't see you or why sometimes it feels like we're abandoned. And yet, time after time, you remind us that we just got to open our eyes and if we look closely, there you are. There you are in the comfort of a friend. There you are in the phone call of of a neighbor. There you are. You show up in so many ways. Help us, O God, to look with clarity and compassion into the face of others. No matter how insignificant they may seem to our life, because it may be in them that we find you. And help us this morning to see you in the faces of those who mourn. For those that we share the faith tradition of Sarah and Abraham, particularly those in Pittsburgh, we ask for your comfort and that you would bring shalom. Open our ears to listen and open our arms to comfort. For God, we long for the day when hate is no more and love rules and peace reigns. Fill us with a thirst for justice for all people. Lord, this morning I want to give you thanks for the first responders. For those who put their life on the line for our protection, Lord, we give you thanks. We ask that you put a shield of protection around them and their families. And God, help us to see you in the faces of all people. For we're all made in the image of God. Fill us with love and compassion so that we might act as your hands and your feet and voices in this world. Make your presence known and felt in all places so that your kingdom might grow to the ends of the earth in the name of Jesus lifted high. Teach us, O Lord, how to live. Teach us how to walk humbly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 2013, in 2013 and 2014, Walgreens, Walgreens Pharmacy came out with an ad that was built around the story of a town called Perfect. Anybody remember those ads? Uh, and so they were seasonal. They were a general ad that went out, but they were also seasonal. There were Halloween ones that went out. There were Christmas and Thanksgiving ads that went out. And um, you can YouTube those, and you can, you can watch them even now. And so, but it was interesting how the whole storyline was built around a, a fictional town called Perfect. Now, the, the ending, the, the tagline at the end of the commercial said this. Of course, we don't live anywhere near Perfect, so there's Walgreens. 
All right, I want, I want us to imagine something for a moment. I want you to imagine not a perfect town, but a perfect church. So I want to invite you to do something. I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. And if you don't close your eyes, I'm going to ask the guys in the back to shut down all the lights. I'm just kidding. Now, I want, I want to invite you to close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. I promise we're not going to scare you, even though it's the week of Halloween. None of that's going on. I, I want you to go to your imagination for a moment, if you can do that. I want you to go to your imagination, and I want you to imagine not a perfect town, but a perfect church. Now, this is a church where everyone gets along all the time. It's where every need gets met 100% of that time. The band never misses a note. The preacher speaks with such clarity and and with such conviction that the sermon is life-changing every time you hear it. Imagine a church where the children's ministry offers a program for every season of your child's life. And they do it perfectly. And we have a youth program that sends your kids home every Wednesday night acting like saints. Now open your eyes and look around. You want to know the truth? First Church of Perfect doesn't exist. And you know why it doesn't exist? Because you're in it. And because I'm in it. But that shouldn't stop us from imagining the possibility of what it could be. And that's what I want us to do today. I can only speak. I did the same thing for chapel. And I I, I did a sermon that was sort of targeted toward the folks in chapel. And I'm going to do a message today that's targeting for the folks that are in here to share with you what I imagine this worship environment becoming and where we're going as a worshiping community. Barbara Brown Taylor writes about the importance of imagination when it comes to faith. She says that faith is in many ways putting our imagination into practice. Faith fuels the imagination and imagination fuels faith. We Christians, we believe in a God that we can't see. And yet when we let God work through our imagination, we don't see God. But what we do see is the possibilities of what God can do through us in God's world. Now here's the truth. The future of our church, the future of any church for that matter, the future of the church It's not going to depend on fancy programs. It's not going to depend upon excellent program. And we want to be excellent in all that we do. It's not going to depend on big buildings or bigger buildings. Our future rests on our ability to imagine new possibilities and to show the, the world that there is a different way of living. There is a different way of living in a hurting world. Listen, church, we got the best story going. You're not going to hear a story more true than the story that we share every week. We believe in a God who created all and a God has chose to reveal himself to us all. We got the best story going in the story of Jesus, his life, his birth, his birth, his death, and his resurrection. We have the story of the Holy Spirit who is present with us right now. So imagine, imagine a church community where the number one priority is to tell the story of the gospel to tell the Jesus story, to do whatever it takes to make sure this community and the world knows the story of Jesus. And not only just knows the story of Jesus, but experiences the life change that comes through the power of that story. Imagine a church. Imagine a community of people where, the, where we focus on living out God's story our entire life. Imagine a church that takes serious Jesus' command to love, to really, truly love our neighbors. 
Imagine a church where we sit back and we listen before we write action plans and vision statements and mission statements, that we really sit back and we lean into the work of the Holy Spirit and we discern what is God wanting to do through us. Imagine a church that is passionate about living the way of Jesus. Now imagine a worship environment where being real, honest, and authentic is valued. Imagine an hour of worship where we address the struggles that we are facing, where we're not afraid to name the brokenness and share the hope of healing that's found in Jesus Christ. Imagine a space created where we can come and know that we will be invited into the presence of God through music, prayers, and the spoken word. Imagine hearing a a sermon that teaches, inspires, and sometimes uplifts. Imagine, Imagine a place where I can make new friends, where I can celebrate old, with old friends and be grateful that I'm a friend of Jesus. Imagine a place where I can invite my friends, family members, and coworkers that are far away from God and they will be welcomed even in the midst of their doubts. That's what we want to create here at this space in modern worship at 1055. And if that sounds impossible, you know what? It is. And it should be. It should be impossible. Because we cannot, no matter how much we try, no matter how excellent we get, no matter how slick we get in our marketing, we can't bring forth a a faith community. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And we need the Spirit. We need to be reliant on the Holy Spirit. And we need to trust that what is impossible for us is possible for God. For God, all things are possible. Even moving a church to living the way of Jesus. One of the powerful things that I I appreciate about the, the letters of Paul in the New Testament is his words. Simply his words. And I've been thinking a lot about words lately. My own words and the words that I use from from the stage or just words I use in interactions with people. I've been thinking about how words are affecting how we relate to one another in public. Uh, Words that are used in politics, words that are used in society. Uh, There's this, how we speak God, how we speak the language of faith in our world. And, and, And I've been through that lens, rereading some of Paul's letters. You know, the majority of the New Testament is made up of Paul's letters, the Apostle Paul, and and, and he has the ability. Paul has the unique ability to create, to use words to create worlds that really didn't exist before words, before his words were spoken. And what I mean by this is this, this is the power of his letters to the churches that he writes in the New Testament. You know, I I imagine when, 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 a community received one of his letters, that they went away from reading that letter, however they read that letter in the community, whether someone stood up and read it to the congregation or whether they passed it along along among those who could read, however they did that, I imagine when they read that letter and they, got, they, they walked away from that letter, they, they, told, they said among themselves, you know, we could do better. We could be better. And, and so what his words, the words of the, the epistles that we have of Paul's letters, and, and mainly the Bible itself, spoke faith to the imagination. Let me give you two examples before we look at the text we're going to look at today. First one is from Galatians. The Christian community in Galatia was being divided over whether they had to first be Jew before they could be Christian or could they just be Christian. Now, if you're female, that's not a big deal. But if you're a male, that's a big deal. Because that, that involves uh, something physical, and that, that's going to be a big deal. 
And, and so they're trying to wrestle through this. They're trying to go back and forth. Some, there's a group of people in the church saying, no, you know what? You've got to first become, you've got to become Jew before you can become Christian. There's another group that's saying, no, it's all about faith. And you've got to, you, you don't have to go through that channel. And so Paul says, let me, whoa, 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 let me write this letter. I'm going to write you a letter and we're going to sum it up. And this is how he sums it up. This is Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. So if you're uncircumcised, you're like, whew, thank goodness. So the the only thing that counts is faith working through love. When their reality was being confronted with something different, Paul speaks truth and says, I don't want you to let this divide you. What's going to count, what's going to matter at the end of the day for you as a church in Galatia, what's going to matter is that your faith is working through love. So then here's another example. You got the Corinthians. Now, the Corinthians were dividing over a bunch of different things. I mean, some people were saying they follow Paulus. Some in the Corinthians church were saying they follow Paul. Some say, no, we're just going to follow Jesus. We're not going to listen to nobody else. Then you got some who are saying, you know what? I got more money than you. I'm rolling out more money. So I get a first seat at the communion table than you get or closer seat. So there's all these issues going on that was literally about to divide the church. Paul said, I'm going to write you a letter. Matter of fact, the first letter didn't stick, so he had to write him another letter. He said, y'all didn't listen to the first time. Let me write it again. Matter of fact, the way it worked is that, that Paul writes, they get a, Paul gets a letter from them saying, hey, we messed up, Paul. We, we in bad shape. So Paul sits down and writes a letter. That's our first Corinthians. And then he sends that. They receive it. Some of them don't receive it too well. So they write him a letter back and saying, you're just making things worse, Paul. And so then Paul sits down and he writes another letter. And that's where we have 2 Corinthians. But in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes this letter. And he's saying, I, I need you guys to focus. I need you to pay attention. And this is what he says. Here's here's how he sums it up. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body through many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. When the church was on the brink of dividing, Paul reminds the people, we may all have different gifts and we all may bring different things to the table, but we are one body. We are in this together. We have been baptized into one community and we're going to be held together by one spirit. So stick with it. Through his writings, Paul Paul uses words to help people uh, see beyond their current situation to a place of imaginative faith. And and what I love is that his words, his words help point people beyond the reality of a church that is not perfect. Anybody ever been a part of a perfect church? No, you haven't because that means you, you were there and it didn't work. What Paul does is he points us beyond the reality of a perfect church to a God who is perfect. Take the letter of Thessalonians. Now, Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, just a little bit of background, um, just in case you're on Jeopardy, and this is useful information. So Thessalonica, that's the oldest letter that we have in the New Testament. It was Paul's first letter written to the church in Thessalonica. It's the oldest writings that we have in the New Testament. And so he's writing to a church. So Thessalonica is a port city on, um, on the northern shore of the Aegean Sea. Now, it was a capital of Roman provenance in Macedonia, and and so it was a large trade city. A lot of trade happened in Thessalonica. And the other interesting thing about Thessalonica is is that it was devoted, that that its community was devoted to the cult, the emperor cult of Rome. That is, that in the Macedonian region, that is where everybody went to worship Caesar. Because by that time, what had developed under the teaching of Caesar is that he was a son of God. And so everybody would go. So all of this was happening. It's a very urban city. And and so this letter is written for a church that's found itself in this urban center, living in conflict with the people around him. So the church is facing persecution, and it's a church that is also struggling with its identity. It's a very early church. And and so it's, it's a church that's trying to figure out who they are in 
Christ? What does it mean to be the church of Jesus Christ? And so Paul, I love how Paul writes and addresses the people in Thessalonica. And so I want to read to you, this is, first, this is the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. This is chapter 1, verse 2. Now, there is two letters, so kind of like the Corinthians, maybe the first one didn't stick, or Paul said, you know what, we've got we to gotta clarify some things, so let's write the second one. And, and so here's first letter to Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 2. Paul starts out, we always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly. Remembering before our God and Father your work of, and here's three things he says, your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you. You may be struggling with your identity, Paul says. You may be struggling. You may, you know, you're faced with persecution and you're wondering, should I, do I need to continue in this community? Is there, is there a place for me in this community? How can I find my place in that community? And Paul says, at the end of the day, I want you to know you have been chosen by God. Because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in the power of the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit. So that, listen to this, I love this, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. That is, I don't, let me read, let me keep reading. I get too excited. Here we go. Verse eight. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known so that we have no need to even speak about it. You hear what he's saying there? Paul's saying, you know what? I I show up 130 miles away in Macedonia on the outskirts of this community and I show up and I start to mention your name and there's, oh, don't, you don't have to tell us about them. We know all about them. We know how they live out their faith. We see, we've heard about their joy. We've heard about how they, how they live out their Christian walk. We, you don't have to tell us about them. We get it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. Paul is praying for what they can be in light of what they already are. Paul says that when I sit down to pray for you, I'm going to give thanks for your work of faith, for your labor of love, and for your steadfastness of hope. That in spite of the struggle that came through persecution, and the way that persecution came to the the people in Thessalonica is that if they found out they were Christians, they wouldn't be employed. And if you're not employed, then you don't have money to provide for your family. If you don't have money to provide for your family, then people start going hungry. But you've lived that out with joy, Paul says. And I've witnessed how you've lived that out in joy. They've become an example of all the believers in the region of what it means to live the way of Jesus. And so Paul commends them for three things. For their hospitality, for their holiness, and for their hope. In a sense, he's saying, you are what it means to be a community that reflects the Jesus way. Man, Paul, can you write that letter about us? Can you write that letter, Paul, about Gainesville First, United Methodist Church? Imagine if works of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope were the words used to describe Gainesville First. Imagine if what was said about Gainesville First is that that we are an example of what it means to be Christ-like throughout all the believers in all of the southeastern United States. Even Alabama. Just, just kidding. This is how Paul talks about the Thessalonians. He says, you, you've become an example for all people. The three things that, that Paul gives thanks for, the, the, the three things that, that will allow us to, to be a church, he, when those three things, that, that work of, of, of faith, that labor of love, and that steadfast and of hope, the reason Paul's able to give thanks over those three things is because of their hospitality, their holiness, 
and their hope. Paul says, you are known throughout the region in how you have welcomed people. Hospitality is the new evangelism. And if we're going to continue to grow as a community, it's essential that we become a welcoming community. And that we have a welcoming culture. As the people arrive on this campus, they do so with their worries and their fears and their doubts. And they need to feel safe. They need to know that after living in a world of bad news, that they can come here and experience the good news, the life-changing news. And I want us to remember, church, that every Sunday is someone's first Sunday. So how you greet and welcome, how you receive, how you live out your Christian faith today, I want you to be reminded that there's someone here, this is their first Sunday. What does this mean for us? This 1055 modern worship. Here's what I think it means. It means that we're going to, we're going to strive to create a, an environment with guests in mind. So here's the thing. If you're a regular worshiper at 1055 Modern, I'm really looking to you to be a missionary. We're not necessarily going to design this worship experience for the person embedded in the church tradition. We have some wonderful church um, worship environments here that do just that. But we're going to be designing it for the person who can come and experience the life-changing, experience the person of Jesus Christ. And so this service, for you that may be a regular attender, this service is an invitation for you to bring others. Now, I know that I can't guilt you into being here every week. I mean, you know, it just it ain't going to happen. You know, statistics show that, you know, an average, the, the average Christian comes to church 1.5 Sundays a month. Now, that wasn't talking about Gainesville, who's only 45 minutes from Athens during football season. So that's like one Sunday every three months. I, I, I know we can't change. You feel guilty a little bit? Just, am I working a little bit? So I know we can't change that culture, or maybe we can. But here's what I hope we can shift, is that when you are here, I want you to invite people. I want you to get into the habit of not coming to church alone. That that and your family to come to church alone. That I want you to make it a point to invite someone to be with you. And and here's we're gonna we're gonna be very practical and we're gonna help you out with that. One of the things that we're gonna start doing is on Thursday is we're gonna be sending a text out on Thursday to let you know what you can expect on this coming, the upcoming Sunday. So if you're not, if you're not signed up for the text, there's this, I think we have the screen, maybe we don't, but um, you can go to, if you text the word modern to 797979, there. No, not that one, not that one. All right. If you're a guest, you can text that. Anyway, if, you're, if, you're, if you will text the, the, the word modern to 797979, then we're not going to send more than one text a week unless it's for a cancellation, you know, the snow comes or um, Georgia wins a national championship or something like that. That's the only way we will send that out. Um, but, but we want you to use that as a tool to invite and welcome folks to come to be with you, to be a part of the faith community with you. And, and so... And so be a welcoming community. The second thing is holiness. We're going to be shaped by our holiness. Holiness is being set apart for, for the sake of the gospel. It means that we live by a different standard, that we won't be shaped by, by greed or pride or false identity, but we will be known as generous, loving, humble, and truly authentic people. Hope. Is the third thing. Hope will be our trademark. We have hope because we believe in a God who says, I will make all things new. We have hope because we believe that Jesus will have the final word. 
That hope is the lifeline that will keep us afloat in a world that is often frightening and disappointing. That hope is the force that will pull us forward when rather, we would rather stay behind or to stay in the bed. It's hope that will challenge us to, to risk, to create new opportunities, to invite people to experience an encounter with Jesus Christ. It will be hope that will fuel our imagination to see what, what we can beyond what we currently have to where God may be calling us to go. Imagine, imagine in the future if when people talk about the church up on the hill past the bridge with the beautiful stained glass windows, that they talk about our work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope. And they will. They will. If we stay focused on our hospitality, our holiness, and our hope. So if you want to know why you give, if you want to know why you make a pledge commitment, that's why. That's why. Because that's the vision that we're all going together put into reality. As we sing this final song, I want to invite you to a place of prayer. I want you to pray for God's spirit to be unleashed on this place and among us as God's people. I want to encourage you to, to pray for, for Gainesville First Methodist, to pray for the Methodist movement, Pray that God's spirit will be poured out upon us, that the heavens will be ripped open, and that the spirit of God would descend. Let's pray that we will be a community where Jesus is made famous, where strangers become friends, and where the future is bright with new opportunities to be the church in this community. I want to close with the prayer that Paul closed with to the church in Thessalonica. This is, this is Paul's closing words in his letter. May the God of peace sanctify you entirely. May your soul and spirit and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who is faithful calls you. And he will do this. That's my prayer. He will do this. Father God, pour forth your spirit upon us in this place. A fresh anointing, a fresh movement of your spirit. That we may go forth from this place to be the church that you have called us to be. The church that lifts high the name of Jesus. For it is in that name that we believe the hope of the world rests. Help us, O oh God, to stay focused on lifting up that name. Give us the courage to move forward. And give us the faith to walk out in new opportunities. In new beginnings and new moments. Lord, sanctify our imagination to help us to see new possibilities of being the church that you have called us to be for people who are far away from you. Lord, break our hearts for the people and the things in this world that break yours. We join me for prayer.